No, we want it now, or we don't think anybody should have it. We will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together. None of them, when they say I stand with Israel, they are saying I stand with genocide. For three generations, over two million people have been displaced from their homes. No American president will let Israel go down the tube. So Israel will continue to defend herself. Israel has a right to defend itself. Israel has a right to defend itself. Israel's absolute right to defend itself. Israel has a right to defend itself. Yes, yes, Israel has a right to defend itself. Defend itself against what? When are people going to stand up and tell Israel that it is enough to lie? Amerika'da hakları için mücadele eden hareketler günümüzde de devam ediyor. Amerikan seçimlerinde bu yıl dikkat çeken bir Gazze sessizliği var. Bu sessizlikte etkili olan Amerikalı Müslümanlar ve kararsız hareketlerin gücü olabilir mi? Amerika Birleşik Devletleri'nde halklar kendi emeklerinin soykırıma destek olarak kullanılmasından utanç duyuyorlar. 2023 yılında ABD'de Müslüman nüfusun %66'sı Demokrat Parti'yi, %32'si Cumhuriyetçi Parti'yi desteklemekteyken seçimler yaklaştıkça bu durum değişiyor. ABD'li vicdanlı insanlarla ülkedeki 2,5 milyon Amerikalı Müslüman seçmen Biden'ı terk et, boş oy kullan, bir başka bomba daha istemiyoruz gibi yeni hareketlerle güçlerini sandıkta göstermeyi planlıyor. Bugün bu hareketlerin sandıkta nasıl yankı bulacağını ve seçimlerin kaderini nasıl şekillendirebileceğini keşfederken, röportaj ve analizlerle Amerikan demokrasisinin bu kritik anına mercek tutuyoruz. And if you have failed to see our humanity, we have not failed to see your hypocrisy. So what I'll say is this, I think that American Muslims are definitely as a whole um, feeling disillusioned by the entire election cycle, not impressed by either candidates. We know what Donald Trump stands for. Uh, he's a fraud. He's a racist. He has said terrible things about the Muslim community and about Islam. So we know who he is. I have no hope in him whatsoever. I know that a lot of American Muslims feel the same. I believe the bonds between the United States and Israel are unbreakable. And we can never let anyone drive a wedge between us. Now, when it comes to Kamala Harris, I think that, you know, while her rhetoric seems to be more compassionate towards the American Muslim community and towards Palestinians, she's also part of this genocidal administration. Can't talk about wanting a ceasefire, but providing the firepower at the same time to Israel as it carries out this genocide. So if you're serious about reversing course, then you have to show that you're for an arms embargo. Kamala Harris is part of the Biden administration. Is she any different? So I think that many American Muslims for whom Gaza is priority, they're disillusioned by both of these candidates looking towards third party candidates. And the two third party candidates are really interesting this year, other than RFK, Robert F. Kennedy, who's the, the exact same <laughs> when it comes to Israel. But if you look at Jill Stein and Cornell West, both of them have Muslim vice presidents uh, running with them. Both of them are running almost as a referendum on Palestine, explicitly condemning the genocide and calling for accountability for Israel. We asked Mr. Biden if he was on the side of life. We heard nothing. America is not a democracy in the sense that you just get a majority of all the people in the country, in the nation, and then you become president. There are these critical states that really determine who becomes president. There are about five to nine. They're called swing states where the margin is really thin between the two top candidates. And if you win those critical swing states, then you become president. And what we have found, and this was the theory I was working with since October of 2023, is that there's sufficient Muslim American populations in these states, Wisconsin, Arizona, Michigan, Georgia, Minnesota, in those very states, 
we can actually determine who will win. Again, and the way for us to have an impact is by making the ultimate threat to become a credible threat, to non-violently declare that we will abandon the president and the vice president, the administration, for their genocide. Because if it's known in history, and if the media records that we managed to successfully punish this president because of the genocide at the hands of people of conscience, that then it would have a transformational impact almost immediately. And the reason why we move to an idea like abandon Harris is because it makes it clear to every Muslim American that to support this particular individual means that you're complicit in the genocide. We have a strategy and the strategy is to punish the president or the vice president and then take the blame for it or the credit as a means to gain power. That you should never have ignored us. That would then create a, an awakening, a reckoning in the Democratic Party and a reorientation of the Republicans because both of these parties are in charge and govern this nation and both of these parties thoroughly ignored us despite the huge numbers that came out in the streets with countless signs decrying the complicity of the United States in the occupation and the genocide. So our strategy and hence the term abandon Biden, abandon Harris is simply to punish Biden, to punish Harris, to declare victory and then gain the power. The American Muslim community are fighting the ban in the courts and we're not alone. In polling, we've seen Muslims support more third party candidates this election season than any before. We are seeing over 700,000 voters across the nation vote uncommitted in a protest vote. Many of those were Muslims. American Muslims are horribly disappointed with the direction of American foreign policy. We want to see change. We want to see candidates that voice change. In polling, we've seen Muslims are favoring third party candidates by a majority right now. And unless they hear something different, their votes aren't going to be going where they normally go. I don't think they want to end this war as quickly. Many people actually are very committed to, to not voting this, this election because many people do feel that both parties, the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, and both candidates do not really represent our interests anymore, specifically in regards to the issue of Palestine and the current war that is happening in, in Gaza. So uncommitted voters are actually voters that turned out and went to the ballot box and casted a vote. They were just, it was a protest vote, if anything. They're gonna turn up again. And I would just like to point out that American Muslims are in a number of key battleground states. When we're talking about states that can change the election, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan, North Carolina, Georgia, Arizona, Nevada, all these states have high Muslim populations and they might not be able to swing the entire vote, but in a tight race, they can definitely tip the results. Now, we know that historically third party candidates are not viable candidates to actually win the race, but does this warrant a protest vote from a Muslim community uh, for the most part? But I think that it's important to understand that there are many Muslims who are going to say, you know what, forget about it as a whole engaging the American political process is a farce. I think that's a wrong approach. I think that even if you go in there and just write something in, you should still show that you're there and, and there should be a protest vote uh, at the bare minimum uh, from the American Muslim community. And, and that's where I lean in this regard. So whether it's a national write-in campaign or a third party candidate, whatever it is, I think that there have to be consequences that are shown at the ballot box for Gaza and for Palestine. The idea here is for us to show our power that we have those votes that those votes made a difference. And that's the way in which we can gain power, not that we should be silent or leave it blank, which is not a very encouraging, motivating way to participate as well. And so there's two considerations, showing power through our numbers, as well as ensuring that our community feels enfranchised and mobilized, because it's not very mobilizing or empowering to ask people just to stay home. So I had two conflicting emotions. 
One of them was that of disgust, hatred, um, rage, anger, watching all of these people stand up and applaud a globally recognized genocidal criminal. The other one was actually, and, and it's surprising to some people, but I was glad. Why was I glad? Because this completely pulls the mask off. Like, if you're an American who doesn't even care much about the Palestinian cause, who doesn't care about the Muslim community, you could even hate Islam and whatever it is, right? But you're seeing the bare ugliness of the American empire right now and how owned your Congress is. Your Congress is owned. Your country is not independent. Your country <laughs> is operating under the power, this insane, you know, ideology, right? Amerika Birleşik Devletleri'nde siyasilerin kampanyalarına bağışta bulunarak kendi politikalarını onlara dikte eden Siyonist lobiler ve kuruluşlar etkili bir güç olarak gündemde. Bunlardan biri de Amerikan İsrail Halkla İlişkiler Komitesi AIPAC. Bu komite Amerikan tarihinde yabancı bir ülkenin çıkarlarını temsil eden açık ara en güçlü lobidir. Amerikan Kongresi'nde çok az kişi bu komiteyi açıkça tartışabilir. I think that there's going to come a point, and it's coming, where Zionists are overplaying their hand. APAC is overplaying its hand. These organizations are overplaying their hand. And they're going to anger enough of the American public to where people that don't necessarily agree with our cause will, will push back and say, look. We're funding this with our taxpayer dollars while we're seeing poverty in our streets. Our politicians are not responsive to us, but they're responsive to these crazy lobbies, right? Because that was choreographed by APAC. The whole thing was you know, Apex babysitting, as one congressman called it, Apex babysitting, play. You know, just think about a school play where you've got the performance and you got the parents that are telling the kids exactly what to do. That's exactly what happened to our Congress. Right, every single person there is making the calculation of Apex and making the calculation of the lobby. Punishing them if they don't stand up and applaud like, like little puppies when Benjamin Netanyahu, the Supreme Leader, uh, speaks. It's craziness. In order for America to change, it has to look itself in the mirror. This is what America is right now. This is what America is. For every clap, there were thousands of dead children and millions of dollars american money gone to to fund this atrocity and uh, in fact billions of dollars and apac money with every clap it's just absolutely ridiculous democrat and republican actively will continue to support this regime that's you know continued problematic and and i mean frankly genocidal policy and care strongly condemned Netanyahu's speech, as did the majority of American Muslims and young Americans across the board. We saw that a significant portion, more than 100 Democrats actually didn't show up for that speech. We saw that some of the people sitting in members of Congress chair were actually staff and not actual elected officials. It's a shame. It's a shame that we would invite a war criminal who has our government's support, sadly, to speak to our leaders at a time when he's committing genocide. There were loud and strong protests outside of the event, and I think that really represents the true views of the majority of Americans. We do not want the support of genocide. We do not want genocidal leaders uh, speaking before our lawmakers. We don't endorse this. DC's political establishment, they may support Netanyahu, but the American people are by larger numbers every day seeing the horrors of this genocide and they are losing their support. It's one of the most outrageous displays in American history that perhaps one of the greatest autocrats in human history would come before Congress meant to be respectable on December 1st, almost being there now for 10 months, um, I was approaching my primary site of research, Al-Aqsa Masjid, 
And there was one of the guards who hates me deeply, so excited, his face delicious, anticipation, th scrolling through his phone. There was an alert by the Israeli intelligence to capture me and my research assistant. And there began a chapter of research, uh, unimaginable. I was handcuffed on my hands, my legs, coiling into my skin, uh, the, the, the handcuff, Pain, painful, the the uh, nerves burning, stripped naked, paraded through the old city, thrown into a van, blindfolded, claustrophobic, 23 days in a poorly lit room, confined spaces, my company, a, a toilet hole in the ground, behind two metallic doors, my anxiety, my heart rate rising when I heard the clanking of the keys. And I share these stories, the torture, the detention, the 12 days of hunger strike, uh, followed by deportation. And uh, sharing these stories in the encampments and with people, you see a shift, non-Muslim or Muslim. You see a shift once they hear what's happening, once they hear how I, even as a professor, shocked at seeing an occupation underground innocents who are imprisoned without charges like myself and because i come from the west 23 days of imprisonment and torture which is extraordinary for someone coming from the west true but there i saw palestinians in huge numbers underground under control for no reason attacked harmed tortured and the youth we worked with they would tell me my uh, in uh, interrogation sleep deprivation they would tell me laughing at me humiliating me that he would be handcuffed, not I handcuffed for doing no act, that he should be the one who's handcuffed and taken before a court and tested for all these policies that contributed for years to a brutal occupation, most of which has not been known by the world. So everyone is guilty in accordance with their capacity. So Muslim countries are guilty in, their, in accordance with their capacity. They should be intervening in every way that they can to stop this genocide because a person in Gaza is just like any one of their citizens of their countries. But we see the effect now of nationalism and, and, and client states and things of that sort. So, But if you can do more, you have to do more. If you can financially affect the occupation, you should financially affect the occupation. If you can speak out against it, you should speak out against it. You fight with what you have right uh, this oppression and this evil and you are in accordance with your capacity and may allah forgive us all we have to start to think more like an ummah we have to start to feel more like an ummah and i think that has to reflect itself in our khutab in our speeches and our papers and our you know articles in our activism that we're not thinking outside the framework that's been given to us by the leader of this ummah muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam this ummah needs so badly a victory, and this victory can come not from the places we typically think where there are 100%, 95% Muslims, but from a land with one, 1 1.5% Muslims, where we can exercise our influence on behalf of our brothers and sisters everywhere throughout this planet. Right now, we are in the midst of a genocide. We can't fix this until the genocide ends. And that's why we need campaigns that will successfully stop Israel from having access to these weapons to kill. And only when they feel that weight, only when America realizes it's, it's the only country left in the world supporting apartheid, supporting genocide over Palestinians, only then can change come. But that means that other nations might have to lead the way instead of America right now. We're gonna work here to make sure we can change our foreign policy, but we need everyone across the world joining together to push their governments to do the right thing.